Pre President Duque. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ivan Paul. Duque. And just please, throw me a note. And we're very excited about the program today. We're first, I'd like to welcome Camila Gaciera, who is going to introduce formally the president. Please, do you have a microphone here? You know what? Is it work? Okay, good. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the Future of Diplomacy Projects event on a conversation with Ivan Duque, former president of Colombia. My name is Camila Garcia and I am an MP MPA student here at the Harvard Kennedy School, as well as the chair of the Colombian Caucus. I would like to welcome both our in-person and virtual guests. For those of you in the Zoom room, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box. Also, be aware that this session is being recorded, that your image may appear in the recording, and that we may post this video to the Developer Center's website. While this event is on the record, the event organizers prohibit any attendees, including journalists, from audio and visual recording or distributing parts or all of the event program without prior written authorization. It is my pleasure to welcome Ivan Duque, who served as president of Colombia from 2018 to 2022 and is now a scholar at FYU to the Kennedy School. Ivan Duque Marquez was born in Bogota on August 1st, 1976. He's a lawyer from the Sergio Arboleda University, a Colombian politician and writer. He took office as president of the Republic of Colombia on August 7th, 2018, and for four years ruled this South American country with his tenets of legality, entrepreneurship, and equality. His public career began as an advisor of, at the Colombian Ministry of Finance in the year 2000, from where he led for Washington, D.C. as Colombia's senior advisor to the Inter-American Development Bank between 2001 and 2010. He then returned to the IDB as head of the Culture, Creativity, and Solidarity Division from 2011 to 2013. He became Senator of the Republic of Colombia from 2014 to 2018, where he promoted bills including the extension of maternity leave, promotion of electric mobility, availability of the defibrillators in public places, creation and promotion of the figure of BIC companies, and promotion of creativity, creative, creative industries. He resigned his seat in the Senate to devote himself to the presidential campaign that was taking place in the country, where he was ahead at, in, all the, all, in all the polls that placing him as the main favorite to occupy the first administrative position in the country. During his presidency, Ivan Duque led the fight to solve the social and economic problems derived from the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, starting with the difficult decision to decree mandatory preventive isolation throughout the country from man March 2020. This event will be moderated, moderated by Ambassador Paula Dobriansky, Senior Fellow at the Future of Diplomacy Project. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Dobriansky and President Duque. So, uh, Camila, thank you so much. I'd like to just add a few words to what she had in her introduction of the president, because I've had the privilege of knowing the president for a while. But there were some things in preparation for today that I did not know, and I'm going to share with you. First, when I looked at your bio, you have, I don't know how many books, but he is an author. So if you did not know it, take a look because we're here in an academic setting, it's very important. He's been a prolific writer. He's also a lawyer. So as president of Colombia, I think you also, you had the vision of passing legislation that also had a very important legal ramification, certainly for the country and for its constitutional base, if you will. But also, uh, uh, thirdly, naturally, he was a politician. And I wanted to mention this because, you know, it's not often that when a politician runs, and we know this in the United States, we know it in other places, some just squeak by. When I looked at the figures of when you ran, 
my gosh, in terms of the detail here, you were elected June 17, 2018, and for the constitutional period 2018 to 2022, and you had 10,398,689 votes. You defeated Gustavo Petro by over 2 million votes at the polls, and you and your running mate, uh, um, Marta Luisa Ramirez, that really also gave you not only an absolute uh, uh, victory, but a majority and an opportunity to advance various initiatives. So I wanted to mention that because it's not often, as I said, that politicians have that kind of a base. But I'm not gonna begin with that, even though I did begin with my introduction of that. I actually, I'd like to ask you, how is it, how do you feel about returning to Harvard? Mm -hmm. He's been, he was here at Harvard for a number of, of, of in fact, uh, programs, and he said to me, it's good to be back. So my first question, how is it, how do you feel about being back here on Harvard campus? Well, thank you so much, Paula. First of all, thank you for your kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to see many friends here. Professor Ricardo, it's great to see you. Professor Danny Bahar, who came here from, from Brown University, Daniel, uh, members of the faculty, and my longtime friend, uh, Paula Dobriansky. It's a great honor to be here. And I told you that in the past, I, I came here for some executive courses. I remember that I took one at the Kennedy School of Government, maybe in around 2005, called FIPED, Financial Institutions for Private Sector Development. And it was a two-week program here at the university, and I really enjoyed it. So it's great to be back here in, in Boston. I make my stop at the Coop, buy a couple of good books, and, and have a good coffee. So, so I'm here to be back. I'm happy to be back here. And um, I really want to enjoy this conversation. And, uh, and I just want to put some of rules of the game. All you can ask. There's no restrictions. Okay. You know, I am here to respond and reflect uh, about many things without any hesitation. All right, perfect, perfect. But I wanted all of you to know that, if you didn't know that he also has been very connected here with our campus and with the Kennedy School. Um, I also, I want to prepare all of you because there are so many of you here in the room. I'm going to take some time for some of my questions but I really wanna give you the majority of the time to ask your questions, all right? But let me go first. You just came from uh, Sharm El Sheikh. You were at the COP meeting of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I have found it really interesting, your commitment to the issue of climate change, not only while you were president of Colombia, but now you also have uh, put forward an initiative, an Amazon initiative. Please share with everyone here you know, about your work in that sphere, what you were doing at the COP, and about your Amazon initiative. I think there's great interest in this topic. Well, thank you so much, Paula. And maybe as, as you may know, I have uh, devoted a great part of my life to climate action, policy making, and policy reflection. And I did it in my previous life when I worked in development banking. I did it also when I was a member of Congress, and I did it in the presidency. And now I have, different hats, but all related to the environment and sustainability, primarily ESG policies. So on the one hand, uh, I was part of the steering committee that launched in Chalmers Marshaik the Africa Carbon Market Initiative, which is basically aimed to have uh, more African countries developing a carbon market that allows to mobilize resources and try to get to the weeds of society so that they are able to benefit local communities. So we worked there with the Rockefeller Foundation, with the IKEA Foundation, with the Bessels Earth Fund and USAID, among many others, and the General Coalition of Energy for All. And it was something that, for me, was very important to participate there, not only sharing some experiences from Colombia, but also trying to fix some things that, that didn't work that well in the Latin American carbon markets. The other hat is related to the Campaign for Nature, which is the High Ambition Coalition in which we're promoting more countries uh, to have 30% of the territory declare protected areas. We had a experience in Colombia passing from 14% protected areas to 34%, which included 37% of maritime territory and 31% of inland territory, on land territory. And that allows us to say we did it before 2030, which is the great commitment of the coalition. So we're also participating there. And last but not least is the Amazon initiative that I've been working with some members of the private sector community in order to create market-driven nature-based solutions in the region of the Colombian Amazon, but also in the other 
Amazonic country. So with those three hats, I was participating there. And going to your question, I would say that this conference, in my perspective, was a bittersweet. So on the bitter part, I would say that it was, it was really sad that there was not a major agreement reached among the uh, world uh, superpowers, at least to do something ambitious. And we kept the discussion on not moving forward on a more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is, I think, a general worldwide uh, scientific consensus. So that was, in my opinion, something very bitter because we all expected to see stronger debates. The absence of China was uh, very uh, noticeable. And, um, and I believe that maybe in the kind of spectrum that we're living geopolitically, the fact that we had the midterm elections in the United States in the middle of the conference, the tension between US and China and the genocide in Ukraine that has created so much of a, of a mess around the world were things that complicated that. But on the sweet part of, of, of the COP27, I'll say that there were three important milestones reached. One, that on the high ambition coalition for nature, there were very powerful statements made commitments and results shown. Because this is some, maybe a serendipity, but we're having some weeks from now, COP15 on biodiversity, and there's no way to tackle carbon neutrality if we don't do much more in nature. So we got to 115 countries that have signed the commitment of having 30% of the territory protected area towards 2030. And we had 15 countries from Africa that came vocally saying that this is a priority to them. So I think that was a strong part of the suite. The second suite part is the African Carbon Markets Initiative. Because as we speak, we only have uh, five countries in Africa that represent 65% of all the carbon credits that have been emitted. And we need to see Africa with a different lens because if we, if we include the deterioration of land, Africa can be representing 10% of the world emissions. And it means that it will surpass Europe in the closest future. So allowing to have a carbon market that benefits communities, that generates income, is something that we wanted to put together. And $500 million were committed by the private sector buying those credits. So I think that was a very important announcement. And last but not least, I'll say on the sweet part, we saw the largest mobilization of uh, environmental philanthropy ever in a COP in terms of commitments by different foundations and basically saying that they're ready to go one per one in terms of dollar contributions to climate change action in developing countries. So I think that was the suite. But anyhow, I think the expectation is set for next year at the UAE where COP28 has to work. It, it, can be no more rhetorical. It has to be practical and it has to take into consideration that in the next seven years, if we don't do what has to be done, we're not going to really reach the target for 2030, which has to be a reduction of at least 45% of the world emissions, and then have a roadmap for carbon neutrality. Really incredible. Thank you for your um, uh, response on that. Very robust response, I have to say that from someone who spent uh, eight years dealing with climate change when I was in the, uh, as it happened in the Bush administration. By the way, I want to mention that uh, the president uh, has a fellowship at Oxford. He has a fellowship at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And he also, as Camila mentioned, you're a fellow at the Adam Smith Center for Economic Freedom at With Florida you? International University. And I happen to be a cohort of his in the FIU. Uh, fellowship. So I feel very uh, proud to, uh, to, to be there with you. Um, let me go to a very different topic. Uh, of course, a strategic one and then a very focused one on Colombia. I'm going to put them together. First, how do you see the political economic trends on Latin, Latin America? We've seen with the recent elections some major shifts that have taken place in terms of political swing, political swing left. Um, and in your own country. And then secondly, let's home in on Colombia. There have been a number of policy shifts that have taken place. You said you're open to all questions. So, you know, recently there was a statement about pensions. 
you know, announcement about pensions and the change of policy. Could you talk about that, about energy? I'm putting that in the mix. And no less how narcotics uh, would be dealt with. I'm sorry, I'm packing it all because I'm minimizing my questions. So we're going to go more to your questions, but yeah, that's, but that's a lot. Uh, that's, that's a, a lot. major question. You're so. going to have to take this as a whole. <laughs> so, so basically, I've gotten this this question in in many forums, academic forums that I've been participating, and I don't think the the debate is about left versus right. Okay. So let me begin with that. This is not the first time that we see uh, red Latin America in terms of Latin American ideological uh, colors, because we saw it a decade ago. We saw it uh, 12 years ago when. There was Chavez, there was Correa, there was Evo, there was Lula, there was Kirchner, there was uh, Mel uh, Zelaya, and many others. So this is not the first time the pendulum moves in Latin America. And I think that's important to, to have into consideration. So for me, it's not a debate between right and left. But I think the debates that I see are between right and wrong, which is, which is about the policies and how do you embrace the public policies and how the policies contribute to the benefits of society. And we're here in a public administration school where in the discussions, you make decisions based on evidence, you make decisions based on data, you make decisions based on what has been working, and you don't re disrupt things just for the sake of using the word change. I mean, you could uh, obviously address changes. You could obviously try to even, even be disruptive if you want, but you have to be cautious in what are the impacts of the decisions that the governments make. And I am worried about the high ideologization behind some of the policies that are going to generate a mess, basically in a buka kind of world where you have volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And if you combine also the threats to Latin American democracies with populism, post-truth, and polarization that have been very well described by Moises Naim in his latest book. What worries me is that there are a lot of demagogy decisions taking place that are going to generate, first of all, more uncertainty from the markets, high devaluation, high inflation, and are also going to end up generating a major turmoil, social turmoil. And I strongly believe that we can differentiate countries in Latin America today between two groups. Those countries that are leaded by demagogues and those countries that are leaded by pedagogues. Mm -hmm. And the difference is that the pedagogy behind decisions is that there are a lot of unpopular decisions that have to be taken fiscally, socially, monetary, and they work. Obviously, you don't get too much of applause when you apply them, but it works. And it works for society and it works to generate stability in such big moments of tension. While in the other hand, on, on the demagogue side, you're going to see things that are going to generate a lot of a lack of trust. We've seen that in, in South America in some countries. We've seen it in Central America. And I think that's the right debate now on Colombia. And uh, I always have this perception, talking about the 100 days, you know, this is a, a, an FDR cliche. So yeah, FDR was president and everybody talks about the, the first 100 days of FDR, which in fact, were not the real important ones. The important ones were the second 100 days of, of FDR, not the first 100. But I think trying to judge a government just in 100 days, it's uh, sometimes imprecise, sometimes it's full of cliches, but I will say things that, that worry me. I mean, it worries me, for example, that obviously there has to be an energy transition. We all have to embrace an energy transition. In my administration, we worked on an energy transition. We basically passed from 0.2% of non-conventional renewable energies to 15%, and it will be 24% maybe by the end of next year, considering the projects that are now being built. So that's happening. And Colombia has oil, and Colombia produce, um, produces almost 800,000 barrels per day, and we export almost 50% of that oil. And obviously, we consume. But what is interesting is that Colombia is starting to reduce consumption, basically because we have one of the largest public transportation fleets run by EVs in Latin America and the Caribbean, because we have uh, cargo fleets, which is basically the largest cargo fleet run by EVs in Latin America and the Caribbean. 
And we also have a car park of individual property that is growing and is growing on density. So those are elements that have to be considered. And we also have to acknowledge that Colombia doesn't use oil and gas to generate electricity. So why do we need the oil? Why do we need to export the oil? Because it represents 40% of the exports. Because it represents 32% of the foreign direct investment. Because it represents 35% of the currency market. Because it represents 34% of the market capitalization in the Colombian stock exchange. So if you say that you're going to put an end to the oil sector, you know, fine, it can be a, a campaign statement and maybe it can be a coherent campaign statement, but you're giving a message to the markets that they read, they get crazy and they react now. They don't wait five years, six years, seven years. They start reacting now because the message you're giving is that you're going to put an end to your major source of income and you don't have today something credible about what is the substitution of that income. It's not going to be tourism from one day to another. It's not going to be agricultural exports from one day to another. So those messages, for me, are worrying because they are creating uncertainty. And which are the indicators of that uncertainty? The debt that we were emitting in terms of bonds has duplicated in the interest rate in just one year. And the second thing is the spreads, the way the risk is perceived in Colombia has been deteriorating very rapidly. Now on the pension, today there was a, there was a, a statement by, by the Minister of Labor. So we have in Colombia a dual pension system. So you can either go to the government uh, public uh, system, which is uh, basically uh, a government savings account. And then you have the private pension system, which is more of, a, of an uh, accumulated savings over time where you get your pension based on the um, savings that you have. Well, today, there are things that don't work in the system. Primarily that people with the highest income are getting the higher subsidies for the pensions in the public sector kind of pension system. Why? Because it favors those who have in the last 10 years a higher accumulation of income, of uh, salary income. And that has to be fixed. And I believe that has to happen as fast as we can. Now, what I don't like is that now the idea is that up to four minimum wages, everybody goes to the public pension system. Because that means that you're going to take 90% of the people that are, being, that are putting their savings into a government account. 90% which basically means that you're going to put an end to the private sector funds and you're going to harm the institutional investors, you're going to harm the capital markets and you're going to generate more uncertainty. And the way I see it is a pension al corralito because once you get everybody there, you grab 90% of the savings, what are those things going to be used for? They're going to be used to finance government expenditure. So you're going to increase the amount of risk of people who are putting their savings in the, in the pension system. And for me, it is a demagogical decision. Why? Because, yeah, it might sound coherently what was said in the campaign, but you're harming the whole society. And you're generating more panic on investment, and that will be reflected on the, on the exchange rate. And in fact, today, again, we went up to five, uh, more than 5,000 pesos on the price of the dollar. So these messages, for me, are kind of complicated. So I'll say those are elements, but in a nutshell, Paula, I see governments in Latin America that have taken great decisions that have very good economic performance. I see President Abinader in the Dominican Republic doing very important things. I see Guillermo Lasso doing important things. I see Luis Lacalle, Mario Abdo, Nito Cortizo, eh, who are doing very important and weren't reflected decisions. And finally, about Brazil, a lot of people have the expectation that Lula is going to be a radical. At least when we look what happened in the first uh, Lula uh, term, he was not a radical. He actually tried to appoint people that were very savvy on macroeconomic policy. And he, Ricardo, I don't know if you remember, he gave an interview at that time uh, with a journalist under the last name Paraná 
uh, who wrote a biography, and he said, well, my economic policy is going to be like playing violin. So he said, you hand it on the left, you play with the right. So in, in, order, in, in order to try to, 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 to show it as, as a balance. So I don't, I don't think Lula is going to, to be a radical. And in fact, I like that he, well, he, when he said, I am in favor of the energy transition, but Brazil is not going to put an end to the capacity of generating oil and gas. Why? Because we have to admit it. While that transition takes place, you need to keep on using the richness of the underland to face the poverty on land. And I think that's that's the essence of, of sound public policy. So it's not between right and left, it's between right and wrong. Very robust answer. I'm gonna ask one last question and then let's go to you. Venezuela, uh, I have to ask you about Venezuela because it was on your watch that you took in a significant millions of Venezuelans and gave them uh, that temporary protective status. Could you comment a bit about that, where you see now Venezuela and its relationship with Colombia going? And then we go to you. Well, so be I, thinking. I believe, Paula, um, you have to be consistent, you have to be coherent, you have to be congruent in the things that you believe. And, Colombia is a signer of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. You battled for it a long, long time with Colin Powell and with many other countries, including Colombia at the time at the OAS. So we have support democracy as, as the ruling system of our region. And clearly what has taken place in Venezuela, it's a brutal dictatorship. And uh, it is a dictatorship that starting through democracy, then it became a dictocracy, and then it became a dictatorship a very brutal dictatorship. It has ruined many sectors. It has impoverished the population. Six million people have left Venezuela, many of them with frozen bones, lacking access to services, and they were looking for a shelter. And uh, when I campaigned, I said, based also on the inspiration that I had during my years in the United States of the TPS, that the United States at some point granted for the Haitians and people from Salvador and Honduras at some point in time. And I thought that the figure was, was very well crafted and I used it throughout the campaign. When I assumed the presidency, we started working with the UN, we started working with the UN refugee uh, office, we started working with the OAS, and I was calling other presidents like, hey guys, let's try to do this together. Let's try to, to define a TPS, let's have at least six countries where we have the majority of migrants and let's try to have some sort of a quota so that everybody can handle this in, a, in an orderly way. Didn't happen, didn't happen. But I remember the testimonies that touched my heart. I remember going to Machuca, uh, a place that, that was suffered a horrible terrorist attack from ELN in 1998. And I was walking in the streets and a little girl started pulling my hand. So I say, well, yeah, hello. And, and she said, I want to study. I'm from Venezuela. So we started looking at the possibilities and there were so many obstacles that I said to my team, we have to move forward rapidly. So we did initially three things. We had a national government policy to deal with the migration crisis. We granted the Colombian nationality to 27,000 Venezuelan children under the risk of apathy. And we starting started designing what could be the TPS. Then the pandemic came. And in the pandemic, we had the social pressure growing at such a speed that I said, we're just going to move forward and we're going to do it. So we created a policy table that was leaded directly from me in the presidency. I had my chief of staff and some of my presidential advisors work with Migration Colombia and the manager of borders, two very good uh, uh, public servants who actually served also in the previous administration. They had a very robust knowledge. Uh, one was Felipe Muñoz, who's now at the IDB, and Christian Kruger. So we started working with them, and then Juan Francisco Espinosa and Lucas Gomez. So we decided to embrace the TPS as a major policy. And I remember that I spoke about that policy with two friends that are here today. I spoke with Ricardo Hausman when Ricardo went to Colombia to launch, remember the, the trade mission, the internalization mission. And uh, I told you what we we're gonna do. And you say, well, 
that's something unbelievable, but you have to take care of how you're going to deal with this kind of questions uh, from the policy side. And Professor Danny Bahar. And Professor Danny Bahar, I remember that I, I spoke with him and we said, what do you think are the major risks? So the common wisdom was, if you bring 1.8 million refugees and you grant a TPS, you're going to have more unemployment, you're going to have higher informality, and you're going to wreck all your multidimensional policy indicators. That was the conceptualization. I said, well, we, I don't see evidence, to be honest, that, that can guide us to that state. But if we don't do anything, we're going to have 1.8 people or 8 million people that are invisible. They can't open a bank account. They can't uh, look, have a formal job. They can't enter the social security sector. They can't go to school. So we made the decision. We created the TPS for 10 years. And I remember I called uh, um, our friends from the International Migration Organization and Filippo Grandi from the UN and USAID. And I said, the next goal is for us to have TPS cards granted with um, facial recognition, with all the fingerprints registry in one year to at least 1.6 million. Everybody laughed. That's not going to happen. People don't want to register. They believe that if they register, you're going to, you know, you're going to kick them out of the country. As we speak today, we have 1.6 million Venezuelans in Colombia that have received the temporary protection status. And the nice thing about it, we got a reduction on the informality indicator. We got a reduction on the unemployment indicator. And we have a lower multidimensional poverty vis-a-vis -vis 2019. So... Professor Danny Bahar, and not me, because you know when we when I say these things as politicians, there's always kind of reluctance. You know, is he saying the real thing? He just published a book, a, a paper, Ricardo, on NBER, and he has demonstrated that this policy has become an icon, a reference model in you, in which you don't have to be rich to assume such a migration wave, and you can actually see that good migration policies trigger entrepreneurship, trigger jobs, and include society. So I feel very proud about that. Well, you should. I think you should. That's why I asked the question, because I think it was a real uh, uh, achievement and also a great leadership. Let's go to you. Uh, questions? Questions? Yes, let's go to the back. If you'll stand up. Uh, yes, you. And so if so you, I propose if you something. Let's, let's take a group of, okay, of, sure. of, of some well, questions, sure. and then I'll try to respond. We'll take about, we'll, let's take three. If you don't mind introducing yourself, and then we'll go to the back there. I think you did. Go ahead. Hi. Um, President Duque, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Tristan Vatel. I'm from Paris, France. Say, say again your name, please. Tristan Vatel. Tristan Vatel. Um, um, so I'm a representative of MIT Sloan. Um, and a member of the sustainability initiative over there. You you're, were at, talking... you're at MIT, you said. Yes. Right? Okay, thank you. So you, you were talking earlier about the importance of um, disseminating facts in, in policy toolmaking. Um, a lot of people have been working on a tool called En-ROADS uh, at MIT, uh, which has been um, shown at the Conference of the Parties that you were at. Um, so I th if you guys want to take a look at it together, um, so if you want to go to climateinteractive.org on your phone, it'll take 30 seconds. Um, please do it with me. It's it's for your own good uh, after this. And um, are you making an advertisement or are you? No, I'm, I'm not making an ad. <laughs> no, no, I'm not making an advertisement. I'm I'm, I'm following what President Duque was was Thank saying you. earlier. Yeah. And so this tool, the the goal of this tool has been to disseminate facts in policymaking, um, and they've been trying really really hard to. Uh, essentially push that tool in policymaking uh, at the conference of the parties. Um, and I think it's it's worth looking at. And every country uh, has been uh, applying the En-ROADS tool, including Colombia, um, at the conference of the parties. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you for sharing, thank you. Thank you for thank sharing you. that. I think uh, we had another hand up there while we're up there. No, OK. Uh, we have right here, right here, the gentleman with the, I think, uh, as I can see, with the scarf, yes. Thank you, um, and then we'll come down here. Uh, thank you, President Duque. My name is Andres Parado. I'm an MPID2. Uh, my question is about the tax reform from 2021. Concretely, uh, what would you change about how the tax reform was 
advertised to the public and the response of the government to the subsequent um, the subsequent protests, given that some international organizations have said that there were major human rights violations. Thank you. Thank you. And can we come down here? And then we'll come in the middle and then we'll come over here. Okay, uh, young man right here. If you don't mind introducing yourself, thank you. President Duque, thank you for coming speak with us. My name is Eduardo. I'm an undergraduate student, second year student from Brazil. My question is about the youth district councils. It was the first time in the Latin American country that we had youth district councils, both at the local, regional, and national level. I participated in the National Youth Parliament in Brazil. It was a life-changing experience, but they couldn't, we couldn't get involved in real policymaking. It was more of a simulation. I wanted to hear a little bit of the lessons and what you can say about to other Latin American countries if we can implement this policy as well. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. President Duque, if I may say on the first question, we'll try to get that information and we'll share it with you. Because And thank you for having shared it. It was Chrétien, right? Christian, sorry. Okay. Else. Please. I, I thought we'd take, all right. Let's think, let's think, let's uh, take, may we take these or you want to take no, a let's few think, more? Let's take five. We, okay. we have three, right. let's take five, the and then we go to five, another so round. Why don't we go to the two? Oh, we got three. We're going to take over six. the next three. We're going to take Good. these three right here. Yeah. In the middle. Yeah. <laughs> and then we'll Good. come over here. So just pass the mic to one another. Thank you. <laughs> Please. Thank you, President Duque, for being here. Um, first, I want to welcome you from the Harvard Colombian Student Society. Uh, we are about 150 members here at Harvard. And I know many of them would like to be here to ask you many questions. And what is uh, your name? My name is Alejandro Garcia. I'm a Master of Public Health student at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. Um, my question is going to be focused about public health right now. So I want to ask you specifically about um, the restart of aerial fumigation in Colombia with glyphosate, that we know that it has a health effect in the population and in uh, crops and in people and in the long term there are studies and evidence based medicine that shows that uh, it's toxic and it ha it also generates uh, cancer on the long term so first um uh, why did you restart aerial fumigation in colombia and the second one is about fracking uh, you were supportive of fracking during your presidency uh, and now that has stopped and we also know that fracking uh, has a health effect in the population so those are my main two questions, and thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Alejandro. Thank you, President Duque. My name is Catalina Melendez. I am also from the Harvard uh, THN School of Public Health, and I'm also doing an MBH. Um, my question pertains public health as well. Um, after the COVID pandemic, your government stated that there were like various impacts, and we know that at the global level as well, and other um, indicators of health status, including um, some forms of mortality, excess mortality, um, mental health and whatnot. Um, and the current government is proposing a health reform um, to try to tackle these problems. Uh, but in your perspective, what would be the main um, policy reforms or the main programs that should be implemented to try to tackle those increases um, that we had after the COVID pandemic. Good. Thank you. Thank you, and let's take yours. So we'll take those six, and then we'll go to this side of the room after the answers. Okay. President Duque, hi. My name is Susana Orrego. Um, I'm from uh, uh, healthcare um, medical school. So my question is related for um, after COVID-19, we have a huge impact in telemedicine. What do you think that we need to change in order to be a reference for universal health coverage uh, worldwide with a uh, low and middle income country? Thank you. Thank you. Good. And he'll take the mic back. Thank you. Okay. Please. Yeah, me to stand. Uh, uh, however you want. So, so, <laughs> however you want. So let me uh, try to go to some of the questions that I have. Right. So <laughs> let me begin. Uh, Christian, uh, thank you for, for your question. And in fact, I'm going to look at the numbers that you shared and the indicators. I really thank you for that. Andres, where is Andres? So Andres, you asked me about the tax reform of 2021. So I have quite an experience on tax reform for different multiple reasons. I still have scars and wounds from, <laughs> from that. So, I, so what I'll say is the following. Colombia taxing system, at the moment where my administration began, we had this conversation with you many times, Zuka. We had a high level of fiscal weight on the private sector. 
either micro, small, and medium, and large size enterprises. The economy was growing at 1.7% in 2017. And I said throughout the campaign that we wanted to reduce taxations on corporations to trigger high end investment. And also, we said that we wanted to introduce the digital invoice, that we wanted to improve tax collections, and that we needed to start thinking on expanding the base. Why? Because we talk a lot about fiscal policy, and you're here in a public policy school. When you look at countries like Colombia, only 5% of the population pay income tax. Only 5% of the population. Now, is that good taxation? That's a discussion that we might have. But you can't think of a country that attends all the social requests just with 5% of the population paying income tax. Also, we had higher levels of evasion. Why? Because there was, there was too many cash in the circuit of payments in society. And also because we didn't use modern technology from taxation policies to increase income. So basically, I'll just summarize what we tried with that reform. We said, how do we lower the taxation on corporations? So in order to have larger capex investment, we say you don't pay VAT tax on capital goods on the VAT on capital goods. So that lowered the taxation. We also said that you could discount by 50% your local taxes that were very high. And it also was an obstacle to dynamize the economy in the regions. And we introduced the digital invoice. And we also said clearly that we wanted to bring incentives for startups, renewable energies, and many other sectors. So what did the evidence tell us? By the end of 2019, the economy was growing above 3%, one of the highest growth in Latin America and the Caribbean. We were able to increase the tax collections by 10%. We end up 2019 having, for the first time since we have the fiscal rule, a primary fiscal surplus. And we also saw that the reduction of the deficit came to the lowest fiscal deficit in almost seven years. So it proved it was working and the economy was growing. And we started 2020 with the economy growing above four or 5% January, February, March. And then the pandemic. So what do you do in a pandemic? So we just say, okay, we're going to keep the deficit as it is. Whole world had to pump money to face all the restriction policies and try to save formal jobs. So there was an expansion of budget worldwide, an expansion of debt worldwide. And it happened everywhere. <clears throat> if you look at the IMF indicators, we have, on average, the relation debt to GDP around the world is 96% as we speak. And we basically pass from 50% of debt to 56% of debt. And yes, we expanded the deficit from basically 1.5% to almost 6% to deal with such a situation. But what did happen, it's interesting, we started recovering basically in June, July, when we launched the equivalent of our new deal, Compromiso por Colombia, bringing resources from the private sector, the public sector, and increasing investment. And that helped us as a country by the end of 2020 to say goodbye to the recession. And in 2021, because of that expansion of investment, of substantial investment, we ended up growing 10.7%. And this year, yesterday, the number for the first uh, nine months of the year came out. We grew above 7%. This year, we hopefully can grow above 7% because of those decisions we made. 
But when I was sitting with my economic cabinet at the end of 2021 or 2020, I said, guys, we have to go again to a painful situation. Because I didn't mention this, in 2019, the first reform was knocked down by the constitutional court and we have to pass it again in a period of six weeks, which we did. And it's not something that you, you know, you don't feel happy passing tax reforms. <laughs> it's very complicated. So, but I called the team and I said, I am worried that if we don't present a reform in 2021, it's gonna be more difficult for the country afterwards because there's gonna be an inflation spiral that is gonna be triggered by all the logistical supplies around the world. So I prefer to take the unpopular decision now of going again with a reform, but try to make a reform that allow us to increase collections, trigger growth, but at the same time, expand the social benefits to the poorest of the poor. And that was the reform we presented in March. A reform that was aimed to increase the collections, to expand the social safety net to almost 7 million Colombians additional to the ones that we had. We were also, with that, guaranteeing the payment of the free public higher education for the poorest of the poor and the emerging middle class. And we made, I mean, I did everything I could to communicate what I wanted to achieve. But we didn't. If I have to take the responsibility, I take it. But we did all we could. And basically to tell the Colombian people that in a orderly way, expanding debate by being able to, to give back the VAT on the poorest of the poor, changing the negative effects of the VAT was something that was working and we should go aggressively on it. It didn't happen. Why? Because it was used also to generate a turmoil. And it's, sometimes it's kind, of, it's kind of funny because I see those who were the major promoters of that reform are the ones who are now promoting new reforms, new taxing reforms. And that's politics. And we have to deal with that. And you're going to have to deal with that when you leave this university and you go to office. And you're going to take the hard decisions. And you're going to be very technical. But when people want to get political, it doesn't matter if you have the arguments, nor the data, nor the evidence. If it's going to be political, it'll be political. So I had to withdraw the reform because they were burning the country down. But I said to my team, we're not giving back. We're going to present it again. And we're going to increase the consensus. And maybe if there's a lesson I took, is that maybe you have to exhaust consensus building, no matter how long it takes, but you have to. And we were able to pass the reform, and the reform increased the tax collections one, what, by 1.8% of GDP, which has been the biggest so far. We'll see how the next one goes. But it has been the biggest so far. Now, on the protest, man, you know how much it hurts to me when I see people angry, when I see suffering, when I see poverty. And I bet you're here in a public policy school, not because you're, you want to go to a, you know, a Silicon Valley once you graduate or run a, a hedge fund, which you could, but you're here because you have a passion for public service. And all of you are thinking of going to public service. That's my case. I, I might, could have been sitting in your chair at Georgetown University 15 years ago. And we wanted to do things the right way. And I always said, there's no tolerance with wrongdoings from members, individual members of our police forces or our military. And there are investigations that have been open and that those who did things beyond the law will have to pay for that. But dealing with that turmoil, also gave me the lesson that we had to deactivate the conversation, the, the situation with the youth population, engaging with them in a dialogue, that we have to talk to the unions, that we have to talk with the political sector, but that we cannot tolerate the acts of violence and urban terrorism. And they, ha they had to be managed by the whole state with the judicial system on our hands. And that's why 
more than 250 people who participated in the destruction of infrastructure have been trialed and will be trialed. And that's a fact. So I connect this with the question of youth. Who asked the question of, of, of youth? Thank you, Brazil. This is something I want to say. Colombia had a law that was approved by my predecessor's administration in 2012, which was the Youth Statue of Colombia. But since 2012, the elections were never called to elect publicly the representative of all the youth in Colombia, municipal, regional, and national. And I sat down with the electoral system and I said, and let's go for it. We were actually going to do it in 2020. We had the pandemic, impossible. And we said, we go for it in 2021. And it has been the highest mobilization of youngsters in the history of Colombia, Paul. Without any, any political incentive different than serving and representing communities, we got more than 1 million youth, youth from 14 to 28 going to the polls and electing the representatives. And that is a triumph of democracy. So we have the representatives in the municipalities, the states, or the departamentos, and, and, and the national representation. Now, the next step, which is where we are, is are the mayors, the governors, and the government going to use the feedback, the policy contribution from those councils? I really hope they do. Because what you don't want to, to have is people that have been elected and then they're frustrated because they're not fulfilling their purpose of that election. But I see there's a commitment. I have to recognize there's a commitment from all levels, but I think it has to become operative. So that's something that I also wanted to mention. We have the public health questions. So right? two, I'll I have the two public health. Three, so three. Let me begin by fracking. <laughs> President Duque, you have been a champion of fracking. <laughs> False. Falls. Well, I've never been a champion of fracking, but I can tell you what happened with fracking in Colombia. When the United States decided to use non-conventional fields to increase the production and reduce the dependency on foreign oil that started in 2004 until today, well, you, can, you know that it has been successful in the United States. Whether you like it or not, you just really reduce the dependency on foreign oil which was the major concern of national security in the early 2000s. In Colombia, in the years between 2006 and 2010, there were licenses given for fracking projects. And it created a major controversy. Then it stopped and then it came back after 2012. So they were granted, but again, it became political. So this is bad, you have to consult the people, you have to do all the things to exhaust the mechanisms of consultation. But the licenses were granted. So when I assumed the presidency, I saw the mess. And I said, so we're gonna make the decision based on what? Politics? Okay, so it's a measure of force. No, let's base our decisions on science. So we called the experts from the oil and gas sector and we called the expert from the environmental sector and we created a national commission to reflect on this and try to guide the government in making the best decision possible. And you know who was in that council? Brigitte Baptiste was one of the most recognized environmentalists in Colombia. We have people from the industry and what they said is, you know what? Let's do some exploration, scientific pilots. No commercial extraction. No massive extraction, but let's try to do five or six pilots that work for the country. And that is what was approved. Those pilots, just to explore, to understand if the aquifers were gonna be affected, if it was gonna be an yeah. affection on the lines of cross uh, edges of rivers, if we had a higher uh, maybe tectonic uh, impact that could generate some levels of, of, of minor quakes in some parts of the country. And those were the pilots that we were about to see what were the results, but they have been stopped. Why? Because again, 
politics was above science. And I don't agree with that. I just want the science to tell me what is it that science knows? Because what is difficult to understand is that you rely on science to fight COVID. The best policy making to fight COVID base your decisions on science. But when you're going to talk about fracking, let's be political. That doesn't work, at least not in my conception of public policy. But I'm, now, now, I'm not now in office, and they have been stopped. So we never knew from a technical standpoint or a scientific standpoint what was the possibility. Now, you asked me about aerial spray. And this is good to say because people say, Duke is a champion of aerial spray. Like, you know, I wake up every morning and where do I have a, a, a little bit of land to spray? No, it doesn't happen like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good, to, it's good to put things in that context. But I can tell you what happened in Colombia. When we approved Plan Colombia in the early 2000s, and from 2000 to 2015, the country reduced the, the, the uh, illegal crops from 188,000 crops to less than 50,000. And it was not just aerial spray, it was aerial spray, manual eradication, but also social products, processes and projects with the communities. In 2015, it stopped. It stopped for reasons that, that were uh, well described by the Minister of Health at the time, but it stopped. And from 2015 to 2018, we passed from less than 50,000 hectares to more than 200,000 hectares. That's a fact. Now, when I assumed office, I say, okay, how can we manage this? Because there was a ruling from the Colombian Constitutional Court. So basically it gave us all the steps that we had to follow. And it took me basically four years to go and, and fulfill all the environmental criteria, all the social criteria, all the healthcare criteria. We had as much studies that you can ever imagine. And we were step by step, but not because I was a champion of aerial spraying, but because we need to see this situation in a multidimensional way. So I prefer to go manual eradication and I prefer to do substitution with the communities. But where you have industrial production, you have to use the aerial spray programs. And we try to be even more precise and we started using precision technologies that today are applied to many other crops around the world. But we couldn't have one single plane doing aerial spray because of those restrictions. And now there's not going to be any aerial spray. There's not going to be manual eradication. And we'll see how it goes. But my, my worry is that we might end up next year with more than 300,000 hectares. And that is a security problem. It's a social problem. And it's also a public health problem from the standpoint of violence. Now, on COVID and the healthcare system of Colombia, this is something that I, that I really want to make this reflection because when I was a senator, I remember that we had the political debates of those who said, the public system of Colombia sucks, doesn't work. We have to rely on a fully public healthcare system. Health cannot be a business. Nobody can earn money in, in medical services. Tell that to the students who are in Harvard Medical School paying the amount of money they're paying for their tuition. Sure. If, if they now want to make money out of the, what they're learning, obviously serving community, you can do well and do good at the same time. So it's ideological, right? But who saw the system? And definitely I said that throughout the campaign, we have to shut down the insurancers that are, that are providing a bad service. And we got to close almost 11 insurancers that were bad quality during my administration. We fulfilled that promise. Maybe we didn't scream it that much, but we did. And when we saw the pandemic emerge, and this is, this is the lesson. The lesson is the pandemic is breaking. We have to deal with this. How many ICUs do we have in Colombia? 5,300 ICUs. We had a higher density of ICUs than Chile, than Mexico, than Brazil, than Argentina. And it happened because we have a hybrid model where you have private sector participants and public sector participants in a very clear regulation. And you can like me or dislike me, or you can like or dislike my administration, but the facts and the data, at least from the Bloomberg Pandemic Resiliency Index, 
puts Colombia number first in Latin America and the Caribbean, number second in the Western Hemisphere after Canada, looking at the way we confronted this. My worry is that if this become, becomes ideological, the next reform, they're going to say, okay, let's shut down all the private insurances. Sounds, you know, very coherent politically. A few years down the road, you're going to see the pain that this is going to create for Colombia. So if we make decisions based on data, I prefer the sentence, if ain't broken, why fix it? We have to introduce there some reforms, yes. We have to try to make the system more uh, precise in some things. But just on telemedicine, for me, it was, it was a revolution. We had, on a monthly basis before the pandemic, 400,000 consultations that were either at home or virtually. Today, we have 10 million a month. And we had the decrees and we approved the bills and it's working. And it's not Duque's reform, it's Colombia's reform because I believe in state policies. So I am very worried that they're going to wreck the healthcare system just by putting ideology before policy, before data and before evidence. And that's something in which I absolutely disagree. And maybe it will be great for you who are here in Harvard at the Kennedy School, at the Belfort Center, and also in the Public Health uh, uh, Institute or program to make an academic reflection. And you tell me, look at the amount of ICUs. Colombia has a coverage of 99.6, the highest coverage of a South American country, if not a Latin American country. And can we improve quality? Yes. But let's look at mortality rates in Colombia derived from, from different uh, diseases. And you'll find out that we have one of the best field epidemiology uh, environment in the region. And that has not been built by me, it has been built over the years. So that's why more than a revolution on everything, sometimes I prefer fast evolutions and we build from what was built before. Thank you. So let's go to another round if you want, Paul. Yeah, Am I missing uh, something? No, 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 no. But we will do another round here. So why don't we bring the mic here? We're going to try to get all of these questions in. So all I ask is please be brief, okay? Because we have 15, yes. 20 minutes. So brief and brief, okay, please. Yes. Hi, yourself. President. My name is Pedro Gonzalez. I am a dual degree here at Harvard Kennedy School, I'm doing an MBA. I'm doing an MBA at Stanford. Uh, I'm that from Cal. Cool, huh? That sounds cool. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's very cool. So you you have to uh, move from one side to the other yes. once in a while. Yes. Good. Good for you. Uh, I'm from Cali. Um, the social crisis that happened last year affected us all. But like being from Cali, I, like it personally, like it was very hard. Um, my question is, what are your reflections? From, from that social crisis and how you manage the situation in Cali and why you made the decision of announcing on May 9th that you were not gonna go to Cali and then ended up like coming at 3 a.m. Uh, creating a little bit of like insecurity, like my family and I personally felt unsafe that if the president was not, didn't feel safe to come to Cali, how we were gonna be safe being there. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to you. Just pass the mic right there. We'll come to you and then we're going to get that section. Go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you for being here, Mr. President. I'm, I'm Diego. I'm an MPA student here at the, at the Kennedy School. And as a Venezuelan, I have to say, you cannot overstate the role that Colombia played in our crisis. We just spent a week talking about migration here and thanks in large part to the decisions of your uh, administration. So, so thank you for that. Um, on China, the, the Pedro administration has signaled a willingness to have a closer relationship with China. Uh, I was wondering what your take is on what the Colombia relationship with China should look like and if we should have at all a regional approach uh, towards China. You know, the, the critics say that we're getting uh, the short end of the stick, whether you look at debt, infrastructure, or trade. Uh, thank you. Okay, could you pass it just right here in front? That's, I think, the fastest way, and then he'll pick it up around the side. If you come around the side. Um, Please. I'm Fernando Rimmers. I'm a professor of education. Is there a political consensus in Colombia on the implications of the Venezuelan situation for national security and what are in Colombia and what are your own views? And do you have any insight as to what are Iran's interests in that situation? Okay. What are your what? Sorry. Iran. 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 Uh, right there. Please. 
right there. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Antonio Perry. I am an MPP student here at the Harvard Kennedy School. I wanted to uh, have your opinion on the implementation of the peace treaty in Colombia, and if you would have managed implementation a little bit differently, given that we had the highest tolls of ex-members of the guerrillas deaths during your government, as well as the highest toll of death of social leaders. Thank you. Okay, let's bring it right there. We got one, two, three, four, those four. Okay, please. And that's it after the four. <laughs> Um, hello, Mr. President. I am Manuel. You got to put it on. Mr. President, I am Manuel from Medellin. And I wanted to ask a question regarding the Economia Naranja, the orange economy. Because at least from my regular citizen perspective, it wasn't as implemented as, as the big thing as it was during your slogans during the campaign. But I wanted to get your insights on what you did for the orange economy what would have had you done differently and if it worked? Okay, thank you, could you pass it? Right. Hi, my name is Juan Esteban Gallo. I'm an undergraduate from Bogota. And I was wondering, in the face of a global economic turmoil and a possible uh, economic recession, how do you assess the new fiscal reform that was recently passed and the um, overall economic agenda of the new administration? Okay, could you pass it behind you first, behind, and then we'll get the gentleman at the end. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is William Jensen from Mexico. Uh, Mr. President, uh, what is the future of the Pacific Alliance in terms of Latin American integration and uh, with the new governments in the, in the region? Okay, and you get the last. Thank you, Mr. President, for being here. Um, my name is Alejandro Chirinos. I'm an MPID from Bogota. Um, speaking about right and wrong policies, war against drugs has been going on since 1980. And we haven't seen tangible results in terms of violence and in terms, like you said, of uh, production reduction. Uh, emphasis has been put on a war against supply and not addressing demand. And that and demand will not be elim eliminated. So um, kind of the, the way out might be legalizing hard drugs like cocaine. Um, what would be your your take on, on legalizing drugs and uh, the huge step that the United States as the main consumer has to make in order to legalize drugs? Okay, thank you all for so, that. Well, that's... We have about... Uh, but no, I I so, I, so I have to be brief now. That's complicated. <laughs> Exa <right>? Exactly. <laughs> so... Thank you. Uh, I'm going to put this here if you allow me to finish. Uh, Kali, the most complicated crisis I faced during my presidency were that week between the 9th and the 18th of May. Very complicated. And it was complicated because by the time the crisis emerged in Cali, we had already withdrawn the reform. It didn't matter. There were urban manifestations of terrorism. And as happened in multiple things, my first reaction is, I'm going to Cali. And this is the first time I speak about this. First time. I speak openly about this. So we had the plan to go to Cali. And the intelligence service came to my office that was already tested with other intelligence sources. And there was a plan in Cali to do two things. Once the caravan took from uh, the Mavi, which was the Marco Fidel Suarez base, to the point of, of meeting, there was a plan to have people blockading the caravan. And there were four members of VLN that wanted to put Lapa bombs <clears throat> on the car. It was a major threat. So I said, let's go by helicopter. Let's do something else. I mean, let's try to find it, but I have to be there. And then we were shown that there was a plot to wherever I entered to block the place and trigger other turmoils as the one in Cali in four different cities of Colombia. Basically, 
to strangulate the government and generate a loss of control. So we valued this very closely. And I said, how long does it take us to have control of those variables? And we look at all the risks. And it basically said that it will take us between 36 and 48. It took us 72. And in order to make the access to Cali easily and be able to control military and police and have the intelligence capacity addressing the major need that was security, not the present security, but the security of the city. That's why we decided to go midnight on a Sunday, have a general security council, and then be back 24 hours, and then be back 24 hours, and then be back 48 hours. So it was a decision that it was politically very costly to me. Like very, very costly. But we were able to meet the targets that we wanted to protect the city, including the capturing of 11 members of the ELN cell that were potentially going to participate in that plan. That's the reason. You got judge me or misjudge me. I don't, I, I respect that. But those are real circumstances where you have to take a decision. And it was a very complicated time. And I needed to be in control of the whole country, not just Cali. And there were people that were paid by illegal armed groups to do the same thing in Pereira, to do the same thing in Buenaventura, to do the same thing in Medellin, and try to do the same thing in parts of Bogota. So what it was a uh, unidimensional chaos could have become a multidimensional chaos. That's the reason why, why we made that decision. And I'm gonna put that also in my memoirs with, with very precise information to be to your point. Next one was China and Petro. China, Petro. So this is the thing, Paula. I, I, love this, I love this question because a lot of people ask me, do you agree about the relationship between China and Colombia? And I have to say, Diego, right? The reason why Latin America has a relationship with China, a dynamic trade relationship with China, is because Latin America has followed what the US began in 1973. Like, who is the major trading partner of China in the Western Hemisphere? The United States of America. Who is the largest treasury bondholder in the world as a nation? China. So there's a relationship there, isn't it? So can we be now you know, the, the, the child of, of uh, divorced parents? <laughs> so how do we manage that situation? <laughs> and the reason why we have decided in Latin America to embrace trade and more trade is because we need to close the trade deficit with China. Maybe we're not going to close it, but we need to export more, right? So all that kind of relationship, I value and I respect. Now, on investment, we want to bring investment to our countries from China, from France, from Germany, from the US, from Canada, from elsewhere, obviously according to our, role, our rules of law. And when I get sometimes the question, why is China taking in strategic infrastructure in Latin American countries? I say, well, where are the US bidders? You don't have US bidders. You have just Chinese bidders or you have a strong Chinese presence. Well, that's what's gonna happen. Now, in my opinion, we'll see how it works. They are in the Bogota Metro. They're in a five generation highway. They're finishing the five generation, the fourth generation highway. And we'll see if they deliver in Bogota. If they don't deliver, it's their reputational cost and people will notice, right? But that's my opinion on that. Now, on telecommunications data, and, and uh, cybersecurity, we made a decision, which was we're not going to move from the US cybersecurity standards of data management. Why? Because we believe it's the highest standard today in the world. And whoever wants to operate 5G networks in Colombia has to fulfill those requirements. Why? Because we don't want to have investors who are going to play with our data 
and are going to put in your party national security by data capturing. So that's an also another thing. I had a very strong relationship with China. We, have, we are the number one ally of the United States in Latin America. We were elevated to strategic non-NATO ally by the United States. But we had a good relationship with China. But I never signed the Belt and Road. And I said that to President Xi Jinping in a very uh, you know, gracious and, and, and friendly way. I said, we're celebrating 40 years of our bilateral relationship. Let, let, don't put me to sign what everybody else is signing. Let's do something that, that is focused on, on our precise relationship. And we did it. And what I don't like is that sometimes it's not one size fits all. With some countries, there's a very respectful relationship. And with other countries, there is, you know, they really feel the hammer. And I believe that's where you have to put your eyes. Because what you don't want to see is China or any other country capturing sectors and then trying to blackmail countries because they have a power on debt or somebody or something else. But that's a different ballgame. So do I believe relations have to be strengthened? Yes, as long as those relations don't hammer our national security, nor our cybersecurity, nor our interests. So we have Venezuela national security, Iran, who asked, you also asked Iran? Professor, so you mentioned your question. Uh, I am pretty much against Colombia sharing intelligence information with Venezuela. That is to put Dracula in the blood bank as the manager. That intelligence sharing will go immediately to Iran, will go immediately to Russia, and will also put a danger of the US national security because of the relationship we have between our countries. The second thing, I believe the TPS had a very important security side that we don't regularly talk about this because, for example, if there was a Venezuelan Danny that committed a crime, he was captured. What's your name? Pedro Gonzalez. Okay, Pedro Gonzalez, well, I'm taking you to the judge of guarantees. <laughs> he goes to the judge of guarantees and the judge says, what's your name? Alejandro Gonzalez. <laughs> How could you prove? No document, no fingerprints, no, no facial recognition. It was a mess policy wise. So we said, we're going to grant the TPS with all the benefits, same rights, with the exception of political rights. But since you have the registry, fingerprints, and also uh, facial recognition. If you commit a wrongdoing, you pay for it. So you either go to the sentence and the prison system or you're deported. And I think that is a very important element of the TPS from that standpoint. That, that standpoint. So I think that should be also evaluated policy wise. I don't know if, I, if that responds to your question. I have- uh, Treaty implementation. <laughs> no, I have here, uh, yeah, peace implementation. Yep. That I always get asked that. I, I, like I love that question. <laughs> peace implementation. I voted no. Who, who asked the question of, of the peace, please? Right there. So I voted no in the plebiscite. Am I an enemy of peace? No, I'm not. I tried at that at that time to make a reflection and a debate and a debate based on criteria, and we always wanted to build an agreement. But that happened. In October, November 20, 2016, I assumed office in May 2018. We had thousands of people who were in the process of reincorporation. Why would I ruin something at that stage? It wasn't neither my intention, but we tried to analyze what the major objective was. So just give you data and facts. I called the UN to stay as an observer four years. The Kroc Institute remained as the evaluator. And we introduced reforms that could not go backwards, but would establish a president forward. Like for example, we approved in Congress a constitutional amendment so that neither kidnapping nor narco trafficking will be considered a crime that is, has a connection with political crime, so it will be granted with amnesty, which I promised in the campaign. I appointed 
a presidential council to manage the implementation. I, I appointed all the other agencies. We had a peace cabinet and we accelerated the implementation as much as we could, even in times of a pandemic. And at the end of my administration, the Kroc Institute says, you have fulfilled 35% of the agreement. So I get people angry, only 35%. Man, this is supposed to be implemented in 12 years, right? Year number five, we're 35. Tell me how much are we lagging? Let's be honest. So are we on schedule? Yes, we are. We moved on the national cadaster. We move on land tightening. We granted 52,000 rural titles to, to families. And more importantly, in 20 months of the first stage of implementation before my administration, only two regional focus development plans were approved. We approved 14 in a wide consultation, and that is implemented. And the Secretary General of the UN came to Colombia on the fifth anniversary and publicly as the most important evaluation reference of the peace process and said, Colombia is a reference for the world. Even the representative of the European Union who participated in the Irish peace process came to Colombia and said, it is unbelievable that in a pandemic, 30 months of 48 dealing with a pandemic, we have seen this kind of evolution. So I'm not looking backwards anymore. Could I have done some things maybe faster? Yes. Yeah. What, what, uh, what kind of uh, maybe uh, hesitations? No, not hesitations. How, what kind of, uh, how do you call it? Doubts I have of things that we could have done much better. Housing for the people in the, uh, in the ETCRs. But you know what happened? We had everything, the contracts, the design and everything. And it was the FARC who didn't want that to happen. It was incredible, incredible. In Davey, Antioquia, one of the commanders didn't want to move forward because they didn't want Duque to be the one giving housing solutions to the people in reincorporation. And I visited eight ETCRs during my administration and I spend time with, with the people in the process of reincorporation. So am I going to defend what we did as a government? The response is yes. But am I going to keep on being a voice in favor of a fast implementation? Yes, I will also be that voice. But am I in favor of granting amnesty again to the FARC dissidents? No, sir. Because if that happens, it's the most brutal violation of the accord. Because it said, it said no repetition. So if you give a prize to Ivan Marquez, man, we're absolutely in deep, you know. Because, because then other groups will say, I'll just replicate this. Nothing happens to me. So I'll just wait for my next process. Do we want that to happen in Colombia? And the idea of saying, you know, let's build total peace and let's tell the, 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 the narco traffickers, you know, man, you can come here, go to prison a couple of years, and then you keep 10% of your fortune. That's money laundering. That ain't no policy. That's money laundering. And I don't agree with it. I, it, it might don't care if I don't agree. But I just give you my, my, my straight opinion about that. I just thinking from a policy standpoint, if you allow a narco trafficker to whitewash even one penny of their fortune, that is money laundering. That's not peace. And I'm pretty much against that. I think I've responded all, Paula, or oh. what else am I missing? I, uh, you have four more, but you only get a minute. You only get a minute for four each, more. because you know what? We have oh, the to, orange economy. Sorry, we have sorry, to, sorry, we sorry. have to, President So let's go, let, let me, let me to, go fast. Orange economy. will, we orange economy, fiscal reform, uh, uh, okay. So, uh, Mexico uh, on the uh, who was, Pacific or, Alliance. Who has the question about the orange economy? You get a minute each. Okay, <laughs> orange economy. <laughs> Didn't I do enough for the orange economy? I'll tell you. We passed the orange economy bill when I was a senator. We created all the incentives for the audiovisual sector. And just giving you a number. On average, Colombia had $20 million of investment in the audiovisual sector. Last year, we reached 380. And it was Hulu, Amazon Prime, Netflix, Apple TV. They're all making hyper productions in Colombia with Colombian crews, and that was something that changed the audiovisual sector forever. Largest budget ever for culture, 
We created the social protection network for artists that were unprotected under the social security system. And we also triggered Colombia as being one of the main capitals of, uh, of uh, startups relating to culture and also creativity. We can elaborate much more, but I, Paula is, uh, has the, the cloth, so Thank makes you. it more difficult. Thank you. Fiscal reform. So this is about the new, who has the, the question of the fiscal reform? The current okay. one, right? Yeah. Yep. So my concerns are the following. You are increasing, you're putting a permanent taxation on patrimonio. Permanent taxation on individual patrimonio. That basically is a punishment of savings. You save, we punish. <clears throat> and you save in, in a house, let's say uh, $500,000, $400,000, you start receiving a 0 0.5 punishment. If you're above uh, $1 million in patrimony, you're going to be paying 1%. And you go above 10, you pay 2% permanently. That's an erosion of, of capital. So that basically gives the incentives of moving your money out of Colombia or putting it in societies or doing something else. Second concern, individual entrepreneurs in Colombia were formalized because they paid through their individual LLC, they had a flat rate of 15%. So you could make 100, 200, 1,000, 3,000, 10,000 million pesos and you had a flat rate of 15%. Today, you only get the 15% out of your first $100,000. So that's what's gonna happen. A lot of people are gonna say, you pay me cash. Why? Because if you're above $100,000, you pass from paying 15 to pay 35. That's a major disincentive. The third element that I don't like is that the reform basically is putting anxiety on capital investments. And if you're investing in a business in Colombia, or if you go and put the money in a CD, if you put the money in a CD, you get a, a, a rate of return of 12%. Your discount inflation will be basically 2% real terms, but, but it's 12%. So, if you're going to do a CapEx investment in order to you know, pay for all the risks that you're taking, you have to be above 15% rate of return <coughs> to at least try to make it a compelling. And I don't think that's gonna happen. My, the way I see it, there's gonna be a great CapEx uh, reduction in 2023. So that's more, more or less what I think about the reform. Pacific Alliance, who has the question of the Pacific Alliance? So I believe in the Pacific Alliance and uh, the reason why it's so clear, and this is something that Professor Hausman has reflected a lot, Paula, intra-regional trade. We have one of the lowest intra-regional rate uh, trade in the world in Latin America. You look at intra-regional trade in Europe, it's above 35%, 40%. When you look at Asia, it's around the same number. When you look at Latin America, it's below 20%. So intra-regional trade is a need, it's a must. It's, 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 it's not, a, it's not, a, it's, it's not a, a dilemma, it's a necessity. And the Pacific Alliance, I think, has done very well integrating the countries. Now, my only worry is that if it becomes ideological, it'll be a mess. So far, Mexico hasn't, make it, hasn't made it ideological, and Ecuador is about to enter, which I think is a major success. We got Singapore in during my pro-temporary presidency. And with Ecuador in, I just only see great opportunities coming. If there's a renegotiation, man, we'll be, again, building a major problem because then everybody won't move, anybody will move, won't move. So I say, keep it, enhance it, and grow it. And I think that's what shall be done with the, with the Pacific Alliance. Last question was on war and drugs. And we <laughs> war and <there>. drugs. <laughs> In one minute. In one minute. One minute. Yeah, <laughs> it, it used to happen when I was a candidate. Like, like, give me your, give me your, uh, your uh, solution to the monetary problem. You have thirty seconds. <laughs> and that's how it works. So, war on drugs. First of all, I think it's a mistake calling it war. First mistake, war. 
Because in a war, you at least know who the bad guy is or who your opponent is, if you want to put it in neutral, conceptualize it. It's not a war, in my opinion. It is a major, multidimensional, organized, organized crime problem with ramifications on public health, with social ramifications, and you name it. I strongly believe with the statement that all the concentration has been, has been put on the supply. Yes, fully agree. And I've said that, that I am very disappointed that since 2020, the consumption of cocaine has a skyrocket, reached record highs, and we continue to seize, we continue to uh, fight the gangs, we continue to uh, fight the money launderers. But on the consumption side, none of the growing markets of consumption and doing anything, at least in a pedagogical way, to stop consumption. And that takes me to the argument, the never discussed argument about cocaine. The reason why I don't like cocaine, I'm not a consumer, I make that clear. <laughs> the reason I, I, I don't like cocaine is because about the damage that it produces in social and, and, and crime, people don't talk about the environmental impact. To plant one hectare of coca, two hectares of coca are destroyed. It is, the, it is a drug that in order to produce a kilo of cocaine, you use four gallons of gasoline. So it's like pumping an SUV to have one kilo of cocaine. And then you also use cement in high quantity from one of the industries that contributes the, the, one of the largest amount of CO2 emissions to the world. So people don't talk about this, and people don't talk about all the chemicals that are deployed in the, in the jungles of the Amazon and other places. So it's an ecocidal drug. And above that, I can say, would legalization of cocaine solve the issue? Well, that's a Milton Freeman conversation. And we can have a lot of economic debates, which is fine. I like the academic debate. But, but we're not going to do it have, today. <laughs> but, but if we're going to have, but this is something that I really invite, invite the faculty, Ricardo, if we're going to have that debate, I want the economists to bring me the counterfactual as the starting point of the conversation. You're a PhD in economics, Dan. Give me the counterfactual to have a, a, real, a very precise conversation, not a speculation, not, not, not dilettancy. Let's talk about with the argument of the counterfactual. If you bring me to the conversation, what the counterfactual is, what would have happened if this would have been legalized in 1970, that's a good starting point, at least from an academic, honest way of approaching the conversation. We need to see the counterfactual. And in the case, precise case of the United States, which is a, a major debate, now for multiple reasons, when, when you see shootings, there's an indicator that people don't like to put on the table because, in the table because it is, it is perceived as, as a segregatory and, and, and very uh, unpleasant conversation is how many of the shootings that have taken place, that have killed a lot of people in the United States, have on the shooters people under the influence of drugs, which I consider is very important because cocaine is not marijuana. And you don't want to combine the right to bear arms with the right to bear cocaine. Because those are explosive debates. It's a public health debate, yes. But let's take it seriously. I believe that legalization can only be an option if the whole world decides to embrace it and taking very precise precautions on how to limit control the market because it's in a very highly addictive product different than marijuana and other things, highly addictive. Like you are an expert in public health. You demonstrate to me that someone who takes one gram of cocaine per week is not harming its health. And you can just look at the, the neurological effect it has. So I'm not giving this debate from a, from a, a church kind of, of approach. I'm not giving from, from a moral kind of approach. I want this debate to be about facts, counter facts and be able to say, 
what is the best we can do? And I will end up by saying, we moved a lot on, on medical cannabis in Colombia. The previous administration of, of mine did, did a very important work in some aspects. I think in others, they, with good intentions, created a mess. I think in others, we tried to do better things. In others, we could have created another mess. But I think overall, Colombia has one of the state-of-the-art regulatory systems today for medical and uh, medical cannabis and President, industrial cannabis. President now, Duque, what a tour de force. You <laughs> didn't leave any stone unturned here today. Uh, I have to say that. And clearly, we could have gone on for another hour. But I want to thank you for coming. It was a real privilege having you here. You took the time and the effort to really cover all the questions uh, 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 very directly, very head on, and we really respect you for that. And we look forward to bringing you back. And thank you for all your questions. And forgive us, I got to take him out that door. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> okay. I, I, I love this kind of debate, as you can tell, but I just want to thank you all for being here. And I just invite you for one reflection. I really admire the people who enter this school, have big admiration for this school. And I know how hard this school works to nurture people who are going to make an impact in policy. We live in times of polarization, post-truth, and populism. We live in a VUCA world. And I just invite you to do things with all humbleness. Never put away your idealism, the one that brought you in here. No matter how difficult the circumstances are, don't lose it. You lose it, you're, not, you're no longer a policymaker. You might be a policy mercenary. So keep your idealism. And the other thing, do the right thing, not the popular ones. Do the right thing, no, 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 not the ones who, who are the, you know, the, the status quo decision. Try to embrace big reforms. And even if you fail, you failed trying. It has been a great honor for me to be here with you. Thank you so much.